Welcome to the NFL Week 6 Sunday Slate Breakdown, where we talk about every single Sunday game on the board. I'm your host, Jacob Wayne, joined here as always by Cody Malstrom and Will Schwartz. Decent week for the channel last week, boys. I went 3-3 three and three overall. A little split. Uh, Schwartz led the way at 4-1. and one. Cody, 4-2. and two, So, decent results overall. Schwartz, you led the way. I'll let you get started first. Give us your best call and your worst call from Week 5. Yeah, worst call, no doubt, has to be Pats on the money line. I mean, it was just another massacre. I, I think we're I think we're broken. We might be completely cooked. Uh, this is getting a little bit scary. But before I get too deep into that, my best calls, I'm going to go with two. Again, I'm sorry, I can't decide. Uh, well, one of, them, one of them was a smaller play than it should have been, but Lions minus 10. I was afraid of the big line, but at home against the Panthers, joke. Uh, and then... My 2.2 unit play of the week. I've been doing. I've been trying to do one of those a week for you guys. Uh, you know, most confident pick, and it's three and zero now. And it wasn't even particularly close. I took the Jets plus two and a half, uh, head to head with uh, both of these guys, and ended up getting the win outright against the Denver Broncos. So that's a that was a pretty big win. Got two units out of that one, and I'm very happy about how the Jets have been treating me this season. It's been pretty categorically on schedule. Well, I would. Definitely disagree with them not being particularly close. You take away that fumble, return for a touchdown at the end, and it's a one-possession game. But that's fine. That's fine. We can talk about that later. Um, well, I had, Cody. The, I had the spread. No, that's fine. Cody, yeah. worst call and best call from last week. I mean, best call. We're going Lions team total over. Holy cow, was that sweat free? I mean, they just looked amazing, even without Opera. This offense just does not skip a beat. Ben Johnson might be a genius and the best non-head coach in football. He just excels at um, getting out of these playmakers in the open field, and it's just so hard to stop. But I won't dive too much into my Lions uh, because worst call, I want a little extra time on to uh, bitch about Jordan Love and this over. I'm so sick of this. I am so sick. I caught so much flack for being well ahead of everyone else saying that Jordan Love is just not good. Um, he, he flirted with turnover-worthy plays. He just absolutely crumbles under pressure like the pumpkin that he is. And he couldn't even figure it out against the Raiders' defense. Now, some of this is on Matt LaFleur because they called a really weird game. But holy cow, I am so sick of Jordan Love. And then put to the, the nail on the head or whatever. I will get that phrase eventually right. Um, he throws a game-sealing interception that made me lose a fantasy matchup with my high school friends by less than a point. It, it swung the other way. I, that, that was just enough to just make me go to go to bed and cry the rest of the night. I'm so I'm so sick of him. <laughs> yeah, the the, the pa- that Packers game hurt my heart, man. Um, my worst call, yeah, not remotely close. Um, this is one unlike the Jets game <laughs> that was actually wasn't close. Uh, the Patriots were never in that game, and Mac Jones stinks. He's terrible. He's a bottom five quarterback in the NFL. There's not even a question at this point, and. Yeah, we're going to talk about him later. Um, My best call was the Colts. Felt like I was on a bit of an island in that one. I took them at minus one. Bet it again when it hit plus two and a half. Big swing there. And, yeah, they pulled out with a win. Uh, Lost Anthony Richardson in the process, sadly. But uh, it's Minshew season, Minshew mania. And excited to see where this team goes moving forward. So we'll get into our week six games now. Starting with another London spectacular. Uh, We got the Baltimore Ravens and the Tennessee Titans. Schwartz, you got a pick queued up here, so I'll let you start off there. Yeah, and quick little plug, I do have the matchup preview for this one on lineups.com, so go ahead and check it out whenever you have a chance. But Ravens-Titans, it's it's a pretty interesting one uh, across the pond, but we're going to do an interesting play. We're going to go a team total here. I'm going to have a few team totals on this slate, but this is the first one. It's going to be Titans under 18.5. Ravens defense, it's second in both EPA and DVOA. Run defense specifically is sixth for both, so that's going to be a problem against Derrick Henry and the Titans run game that's had a little bit of an issue getting going this year. Ryan Tannehill is, he's he's mid. He's not as bad as his stat line has shown this year. He's gotten a little unlucky with big-time throws versus turnover plays, translating into touchdowns and picks, but he's in decline, and if they're not able to run the football effectively, it's going to be hard for him and basically just DeAndre Hopkins to you know, generate enough offense to score on a very good Ravens defense. Now, in terms of the uniqueness of the whole, you know, the whole London of it, obviously that has to be part of what we talk about here. The Ravens came in on Monday. The Titans, we are shooting on Thursday. The Titans are like about to leave in a couple hours. Uh, I don't understand that. Mike Vrabel said he liked how it worked last time, which was first of all, five years ago. And second of all, they lost. Uh, so that's a that's a weird one. I, I just don't understand why you wouldn't give yourself, if you're allowed to, as much time as possible to acclimate. 
We saw last week what happened. The Bills also left the U.S. on Thursday to go to England. They played a Jags team that had already been there for a couple weeks, and I don't think anyone here, even me, thinks the Jags are better than the Bills. So Jags pulled it out. Bills looked out of sorts. I think that Vrabel's making a pretty big mistake, and his offense is likely to be sluggish. So I don't know if I said it, but under 18.5 is the number we're looking at for the Titans offense. It's a decent football number in a weird setting against a very, very good defense. Yeah, I... I don't necessarily disagree with that play, but I do like the Titans to cover in this game. Um, I took them plus four, and it's a shame that it's not a real home dog spot for Mike Vrabel, but it's still, un- it's still Mike Vrabel as an underdog, and I don't really care that much about the, the travel semantics. I think Mike Vrabel's going to have his guys ready to go. He always does. Um, that's not really concerning to me. What is somewhat concerning to me is the fact that Lamar Jackson uh, looked amazing last week, and was not credited with a big performance because his receivers had seven drops. Don't expect that to happen again. And this Tennessee Titans secondary has been somewhat vulnerable. But the Ravens passing offense just like hasn't fully clicked for me. They're 24th in the EPA this season. And I don't know. I expected much bigger results so far this year. And I'm not sure if they're going to be able to consistently test this Titans pass defense. Tennessee, great run defense. So... The Ravens can't get their run game going. Curious to see how that works for them. But I don't know. I think Derrick Henry looks healthy. I think Ryan Tannehill looks pretty good. DeAndre Hopkins is making some plays. Like, this Titans team has has some pieces. And before the season, they were a team that I was looking to back. And I just, I think this is a good spot for them. Um, Other thing I want to mention, too, is their pressure rate has been pretty impressive this year. They are, just have this pulled up one second. Um, They are 24th in the league in pressure. They're seventh in pass rush win rate, and their defensive line has been pretty awesome this year. So I think they're able to get in Lamar's face with some pressure and just kind of disrupt what they want to do. I think this London game, you never want to go too overboard with your bets. Um, Some weird factors that you don't see in a normal NFL game, but I do like the Titans to cover in this spot. Cody, any thoughts from you? Yeah, um, I guess I'm kind of tying in all of our bets together. Um, I got full game under 42. Um... I mean, first off, you know, very, very, very rare moment. I make a bet not based on analytics. It's very clear that players, everyone hates this London aspect. Um, it's just so conservative on both ends. Um, expect a heavy dose of the run. Like, both teams don't want to be here. And it also kind of sways me to, um, I kind of want to take the Titans on the spot as well, just because if we're basing off a ground game alone, um, I think it's going to really, really stay tight. I have this as an ugly one. But the big thing that made me pick towards the under, sway towards the under, is that the Ravens, with their advantage in the pass attack, they still kind of run a conservative style. So it's not like they're going to be trying to like beat them super deep, which is just going to take uh, 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 time off the clock. And then the big swing is when the Ravens get inside the 20. The Ravens, 24th and pass EPA. They, as, as the field shortens, they kind of really struggle to move it when it matters most. I mean, we're talking just a simple field goal can drastically swing uh, towards the under's favor. And then we all know this Titans offense, when they have the ball, they like to dominate time of possession. Uh, it's just real run heavy. It's give it to Derrick Henry and pray to God that <laughs> someone can bring him down. Um, and then mixing with the play action, um, they're, the Ravens are a very well-coached team. I think Harbaugh's one of the greatest coaches of all time. They're, they, they don't get like as easily fooled. They're more than capable of staying in, staying in their lane and don't letting anything get past them. It's just, I think this game really shapes out for a beautiful, ugly honor to start off our Sunday morning. Yeah, for me, I just, I don't see why this should be over a field goal on the spread is the big thing. Um, I think the Titans offense might be a little bit undervalued too. They've had to face the Saints, who in my opinion have had the best secondary in the NFL, as well as the Browns, who have been the best defense in the NFL. So I think as they face, I mean, the Ravens, you know, no slash on defense either, but couple of injuries for them, a couple in the secondary, and then their two top pass rushers are currently out. David Ajabo and Adafi Owe still isn't practicing, so if they're pretty banged up on defense right now. So I think the Titans will have enough on offense to maybe not push for the over on Schwartz's play, but at least keep them in the game. Uh, Schwartz, any final thoughts here? Yeah, actually, I'm glad you started talking about uh, the total and the spread, because I, I, I wanted to touch on why I did such a weird bet as opposed to doing something more straightforward, because... Obviously, part of it isn't just just you know justifying my bet, but why is it the best bet? Why did I choose it over the others? I am a, I'm leaning Titans on the number of either three and a half or four. First of all, it should not be over a field goal the way these teams have been playing and with the general randomness of London. So I don't want to do the Ravens the way this matchup works out. The Titans they've been running they've been run defending pretty well, and 
Lamar looked great, but I don't want to rely on the Ravens throwing the football well to cover in this one. That being said, Lamar did look awesome last week. And if he, when Lamar's in form, it's really, really hard to bet against him. I would rather that just, they, they've been so up and down that I'd rather the Ravens offense just not be a factor at all. And in terms of games being, you know, played on the margins where a field goal could make the difference, I'm going to refute uh, Cody's point a little bit. Uh, the Ravens are third this year in offensive red zone percentage, and the Titans are 29th. So even if they're moving the ball similarly efficiently, it's just I'm terrified of having my Titans number get destroyed by them stalling out in the middle of the red zone or the Ravens being able to punch in scores that they can't. So I'm not I'm not a huge fan of either side. I would rather play the under than either side of the spread, but I'd, be, I'd lean Titans and under. Although I, I just like my play more because one of the things that scares me with the spread is if the Ravens' defense completely completely suffocates the Titans, uh, just as the Browns did. So I'm, uh, you know, definitely not a huge fan of trying to take the temperature of the game overall. I'd rather just bet on this Ravens defense, who I'm a huge fan of. Well, yeah, but what you're not factoring in is I said it was when they're in the red zone with the pass. So if they're finding success on the ground, and that's playing right into the Titans, who do a decent job of stopping the run. Actually, very good job. That is true. Eighth in rush DVOA, ninth in rush defensive success rate and 11th rush EPA. So like I said, when that field narrows and you're kind of reverted to a real one-dimensional type offense, it's, we're talking, not stalled out jokes. I mean, it's, they'll stick at three because, well, Justin Tucker's the greatest kicker of all time. But um, but like I said, just any field goal drastically swings towards the under's favor, which would be beautiful, especially when they both do long conservative drives. Also, one thing I want to note, um, both offensive lines drastically struggle in adjusted sack rate, and both teams feel pretty good defensive lines. Uh, when you soul-crushing sack can easily push any offense back, make a longer-distance gain, and create more stalled-out drives, like towards the under's favor. I, like I said, this, I think this is shaping up to be a real, real ugly one. All right, let's go to the next game here. Uh, it's going to be the Carolina Panthers at the Miami Dolphins, and it's hard to imagine a bigger gap right now between – offensive play uh the Panthers really struggling Bryce Young I still believe in long term but not being put in a position to succeed with a terrible offensive line and a lack of high level skill position talent Dolphins are the, on the other hand really just tearing the league apart offensively so curious your guys take on this game Cody I'll go to you first do a lean that you like on this spread yeah very very rare I take a uh I take this high of a number but I'm on Dolphins minus 13 and I I'm fading this Panthers team until further notice this team is broken uh we're talking dead last offensive line dead last receiving unit I'm not I'm not I'm not out on Bryce Young I mean it takes a while for me to be low on someone this early in their career but when you're surrounding him with this and you're making them really one-dimensional with only an adequate ground game even they won't be able to like exploit this Dolphins defense. Because, I mean, the Dolphins defense isn't good. They're 24th in defensive DVO. I mean, we know exactly who they are. They are a high-powered offensive juggernaut, and they're just going to outscore you um, and just win games that way. They're just going to beat you down with offense. But now when you have the Panthers offense, who can't even really put a scare into this defense, the Panthers defense ain't going to be able to stop the Miami offense. I mean, it's really just as simple as that. They were playing well at the start of the year, but then these metrics have drastically dropped as – um. They have had uh, injuries to multiple units. Uh, the defensive lines hobbled a little. The secondary was without two starters. These metrics have dropped to now they're 29th in defensive DVOA. This is just the worst team in football right now. And now that the Dolphins are getting healthier, minus, um, I'm going to screw this up, it's A-chain, A-chan, whatever it is, I, they still have more than enough firepower to just really move this, the ball down the field with ease. We just saw the Lions do it. Um I just I, I have I just don't see it. unless this is just a gross backdoor at the very end. I have the Dolphins in an absolute route in this one. Yeah, um, I'm not betting the Panthers again after last week, but I, I definitely lean Carolina here to be on to be entirely honest with you. Um, I think their pass defense is pretty good. They're 11th in DVOA, 12th in EPA, and I have a lot of respect for their defensive coordinator, Jair Rivero. Big deal getting Dante Jackson back for their secondary this week, and then. Couple of injuries you need to monitor if you like the Panthers here. Um, Xavier Woods, Brian Burns, and uh, Derek Brown are all in the injury report. Those are three of their better defensive players, maybe their three best defensive players right now. So if those guys are all out, it's a pass. But kind of lean Carolina would want a 14 if I was going to bet it, but it's a pass for me right now. Schwartz, any take on this game? Yeah, absolutely. Although I, I kind of agree that this is this is too big of a spread to play for the Dolphins the way their defense is right now. 
And conversely, I would want a better football number than 13. Like, I'd want the 14 and a half if I was even going to consider the Panthers. That being said, probably not going to do it either way. This is the worst team in football, as Cody said, and by quite the margin, I think. Uh, a lot of the other bottom teams have at least some redeeming qualities, and these guys just don't. But in terms of this game, we're going to go Dolphins team total over 31 and a half. We're going to do a half unit since that's not the greatest football number on the planet, but still should be fine. There's some weather questions for South Florida this weekend. Does not matter is the, is the good news for our bet. For rush defense, EPA, success rate, adjusted line yards, and DVOA, the Panthers are dead last, 32nd in every single one of those categories. And they're going up against the offense that is number one in the league in rush offense, EPA, rush offense, success rate, and rush offense, DVOA. So, I mean, there's no way they're going to be able to slow the run, even with HN out. Uh, Mostert is, he's been tabled a little bit by this rookie rise, but... He's obviously still a very capable back, and the system will just pick these guys up. It's it's an unbelievable offense that Mike McDaniel's installed. In terms of the Panthers having a pretty good pass defense, they do, but in a weird way, even though the Dolphins' rush offense is what's grading higher right now, I think the pass def- or the pack pass offense it's almost more unstoppable still, just because you have that incredible speed of those guys in space. You've got the precision of Tua, and you're not going to completely limit it to the point where it's not at least able to open up the run against that terrible run defense. So I think the Dolphins at home should be able to run up the score. Mike McDaniel has no issue with running up the score uh, late in these games. It's just running the ball out and still getting big chunk yardage. So like the Dolphins over 31 and a half in this one, but I would, I would stay away from either the total total or the uh, spread. Cause I don't want to invest in either one of the Panthers offense or the Dolphins defense. Yeah. Um, one thing I will note before we get out of here is the Lions did score 42 on the Panthers last week, but they benefited from a couple of short fields because of turnovers. And, you know, maybe that happens again. But the Pan- the Dolphins' defense is not as good as the Lions' defense, and I'm not convinced they're going to be able to create takeaways in the same way. So if that's not happening, I don't know. 31 and a half is just such a weird number, man. They, they might get there, but you're really expecting them to get 34, 35 at that point, And that's a lot of points, even for this Dolphins team. So that's a pass for me. Let's get on to the next game, though. And, Cody, we're talking about your Texans, bro. New Orleans Saints at the Houston Texans. Cody, got to go to you first. We had a little bit of a head-to-head last week. Um, you took the Texans plus two and a Greatest half. Greatest result possible. <laughs> I took the Falcons minus one and a half. Somehow landed exactly on two, <laughs> so we were both happy. But heading into this game, do you like the Texans once again? No. Uh, it just absolutely guts me to say that. But I'm not betting the Saints either. This is just a pass for me. Um, I really want to see how the Saints are going to handle kind of this new look offense. Um, like I said, the Texans, the offensive line injuries were um, were a problem, but the Texans have done a masterful job of masking that with a lot of quick outs, quick throws, um, just kind of really getting their playmaker, playmakers out to the open. But this Saints defense, man, it's it's good. It's a great unit, and they ve- they are very very well at uh, getting a pushback from the from the snap uh, with their defensive line, just be able to rush four. And that's what worries me is they can drop back the rest in coverage and really crowd up that middle. And even worse, and I'm not saying this out of bias because he's one of my favorite players, but Tank Dell is potentially not playing. He's in concussion protocol, and that would absolutely be detrimental to their offense because he's exactly what they need to make it work. Uh, worse yet for um, the Texans, the offense line injuries have greatly impacted the ground game because they're not opening gaps. They're not doing anything, really. They're just getting smoked. And uh, Damian Pierce is yet to get it going, and he, they're not going to find success against the Saints defensive line. And then on the other end, this is where it gets really intriguing. Um, I don't know. I'm not sold on the Saints offense. I'm really not. But this, the Texans defense, when they're, they, 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 don't, they don't generate great pressure, they they don't really get a pushback on the line. They're more league average. They're just league average across the board. And I have the Saints as kind of a little below league average, especially when looking at these metrics. So it's it's not a big enough advantage where I would bet the Saints in this regard. But yeah, this is this is just a stay away from me. Yeah, I took an under in this game. I think it's a, it's a good spot to do that. Uh, like Cody's talking about, the Saints defense is excellent against the pass. Their coverage unit might be the best in the NFL. Uh, they're also very good against the run. They're second in rush defense success rate. So it's a problem for a Texans team that really can't run the ball right now. I like TJ Stroud. I think he's going to have a great career. I think we've seen enough at this point to really believe in him long term. But this is probably the best defense he's faced this season, I think, Cody. Unless I'm forgetting somebody. Yeah, Ravens so. debut. 
See, I think the Saints have a better defense than the Ravens, but that's that's a conversation for a different time. Um, it's also impossible to judge, you know, game one because you just yeah. don't know what you're really getting. Yeah. So ultimately, I think this is not a massive produ- production day for CJ Stroud, uh, especially if Tank Bell doesn't play. But I don't think they're going to move the ball that well against this defense. And then you look at the Saints' offense. Um, another team that really benefited from short fields last week, Max Jones was feeling very generous last week uh, against this defense, gave him some. Some nice short fields to work with because he's he's one of the nicest quarterbacks in the NFL. He loves doing that for everybody. Um, but, yeah, Derek Carr doesn't look quite right to me. I think he's still dealing with an injury. And, yeah, the Saints offense. I don't think they're that well coached. They're 26th in pass offense success rate, 27th in rush offense success rate. Like, yeah, just not a really high-powered unit right now. So, I think this is going to be a little bit of an ugly game. I like the under at 42.5. Would play that down to 41.5, 41 being a pretty key number there for totals. So, Schwartz, any thoughts here? Yeah, I actually, this is the only game on this slate that I'm not going to have an official play in. I actually have the MP, so go check that out for uh, some more waffling on this one. But I'm leaning the under. That's my play on the article. I'm just a little, little bit afraid about investing in the Texans' defense. They're getting some, they're getting some, uh, the, sorry, the Saints have gotten Kamara back, so I'm a little scared of invest, or fading them as he kind of gets reintegrated. I, I'm just... I don't know, I'm, I'm a little afraid of fading Stroud because he's been so good early on and they're going to have to throw the ball uh, with how ineffective their rushing offense has been and then the Saints run defense. So I, I don't know, This is I'm having a really hard time getting a good read on both of these teams. I'm going to leave this one be uh, from an official capacity, but I'm leaning under. I would be I would be less surprised to see the under than the over, but this game, I mean, for low 40s, it's right in the middle of the road. Uh, it's a pretty good number, so I would not, I, I just don't want to put cash behind this one. Fair enough. Uh, let's get into our next game. We just talked about the Falcons-Texans game, and we're going to talk about the Falcons this week facing the Washington Commanders. I love this Falcons team. I'm going to be looking to back them again this season at some point. Eh, I don't love the spot for them. Washington coming in, off of Thursday Night Football, extra rest. Um, potentially a decent buy-low spot for Washington. Uh, going on the road, don't love Sam Howell in this game. So probably just a pass for me overall. Schwartz, do you have a play here that you like them? I do, and I actually disagree with you in almost every facet, except that I don't like Sam Howell at all. I don't, I'm afraid of this Falcons team and investing in them, but I actually like this spot for them. I think a lot of things are pointing Falcons-wise, but I absolutely cannot invest in the Riddler. It's it's not happening for now. He's not able to live, deliver the ball unless Bijan is doing crazy. Like He was good last week, And I'm, a, I'm still, I'm not sold. I need to see a lot. I, He's burned me enough times already this year. I'm not, I'm not investing in that offense yet, but what I can do is invest in the Falcons' defense, which has been a much improved unit this season. My gosh, they're actually leading the entire league with the best rush defense EPA. That's awesome. So we're talking about one-dimensionalizing the commander's offense because it's not like they're a you know an offensive rushing juggernaut. They're somewhere around like the low teens in most of those rushing metrics that we talk about, DVOA, EPA, and success. So it's it's a little bit better than an average unit going up against the league's best counter. So that's not awesome. So now we're talking about a one-dimensional offense, and that one dimension is Sam Howell in the pass offense. I've talked in the past about how the commanders have some dudes offensively, but they're 25th in DVOA, 22nd in EPA, 22nd in success. I don't know. They're coming off an okay offensive spot. They scored 20 points, but that's... That's less than the number I'm getting at them uh, in this game, and they played the Bears last week. We're going Commanders, team total, under 21.5. Obviously, in addition to being, I think, higher than it should be, it's a pretty good football number, so you can get those three touchdowns and still be safe and sound. I like this one. I'd rather just not dig into that Falcons offense versus Commanders defense, which I think are both pretty volatile units, and I don't want to try and put a pin on it. Yeah, I like the full game under, and worth noting on the the Commanders uh, offense last week, is a lot of that production came in garbage time once the Bears had already kind of sewn up the game. So that's worth noting. But if I had to make a pick on this game, it would be the full game under. Not an official pick for me for this slate, but that's the way I lean. Cody, any thoughts here? No, this is an immediate pass for me. Um, I was yeah. greatly disappointed with that Washington performance against the Bears. Granted, you could say, you know, Thursday, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I don't buy into that crap. Um, unless it's like international travel, then I start thinking that plays the motivation plays a factor. But this that that was embarrassing. That was an embarrassing performance. Um, I'm you know how I feel about the Bears. I'm super low on their offense now. Justin Fields, when he can get it going, he's a good quarterback. 
But there was no excuse to let what happened what happened in the first half. Though I did note that if it, if the commanders were going to get beat like that, it would be over the top because that's where they struggle with the defense. They're all defensive line, horrible coverage. And Justin Fields did just that. He connected with DJ Moore and some pretty beautiful deep ball passes, and they just ran away with it. They uh, held their lead. Um, the issue is, and that's what kind of stops me from backing the Falcons, is that I don't know if Ritter is that quarterback who can exploit that. And if they're kind of reverted to the ground game, it kind of does lead me toward the under because the commanders are capable of, of selling out to stop the run. And then on the other end, they're kind of going against not like the most explosive type offense. Um, the commanders really had to revert to putting the running backs and just kind of dump offs and having them make plays in the open field. Uh, Falcons do a good job in the second level where they can anchor down and make the open field tackle. I'm not too worried about that. So I do lean towards the under, but I think I'm just going to stay away from this just because I've kind of been a little underwhelmed by the Falcons lately too. I want to see them get back into gear. Um, so this is more so just going to be like a watch and take notes kind of game for me. Yeah, that's fair. Um, let's go ahead and get into our next game then, which is an AFC South matchup between the Indianapolis Colts and the Jacksonville Jaguars. And this is one of my favorite plays of the slate, so I'll just lead off there. I went pretty heavy on the Colts at plus five and a half when this number opened. And it's down to plus four, four and a half across the board. Still like it at that number. I'd like it probably down to plus three and a half here. Um, the Jaguars did beat the Bills last week, but that was a terrible spot for the Bills. Coming off of that emotional win over Miami, traveling over to London, Jaguars had the extra week to prepare for that game. And yeah, I'm not really higher on the Jags now than I was previously based on that result. I still think this offense, whether it be play calling, offensive line play, it's still not fully clicking. And I think it'll get better as the season goes along, but... The Colts have the defensive line to really challenge this Jaguars offensive line that's had some issues. And I think Gardner Minshew's pretty good, man. Um, I think he can have plenty of success in this offense with Shane Steichen. I love what Steichen's done as a head coach for the Colts, but really I just see value on the Colts here. I think over a field goal is a pretty nice number to get in this spot. Schwartz, you agree on this one, and I know you're a big Gardner Minshew stand yourself, so I'll let you talk about him. Absolutely. The Jags were one of the early letdown teams for me that I believed in this year, and they haven't validated it. And then you get that you get these London wins that they are the one team that's comfortable with this situation. I don't want to buy too high into you know what they accomplished over there. I mean, good for them. A win's a win. It all goes in the stat sheet the same. But I think it's making them overvalued, as you said. And the Colts have been showing improvement. Uh, in addition to Minshew, who I absolutely love, and they're going to have to throw the ball. Jags are... Fourth in rush D EPA, fourth in rush D success, fifth in rush D DVOA, but Colts might be able to get into it a little bit with their, you know, they've got their stables of running backs back. They've got uh, Taylor, obviously, back after signing the big deal. Moss has been playing great football either way. So they might be able to get after it a little bit, but they're going to have to throw the football against a more average Jags pass defense. And <laughs> Gardner Minshew, man. Everywhere he's gone, he's come off the bench cold. He's put in good performances. I mean, I'm not trying to say he's like a Patrick Mahomes or anything, but man, he I I think he's a top 32 guy. I, I don't I, I can't look around the league and see who trots out every single Sunday and say, yeah, Minshew's not better than five or six of these guys. So I I love seeing the I, I like Richardson in the long run, but as far as specifically being a passer, Minshew's actually probably more advanced at this point. Or he's definitely more advanced at this point. I don't think that's a slight to Richardson to say. The other thing I'd like to say is uh, Cody's going to love this one. I'm going to do a Josh Downs shout-out. And maybe Cody won't love it if he, if I'm uh, stealing his thunder. But Downs is a guy I was incredibly high on coming into the draft, coming into fantasy football. And he kind of had a little bit of a breakout this week. Six catches, 97 yards, still waiting on that first score. I think Minshew is going to be really good for him. Watch him. I, this isn't a player props video, but it's just a, the emergence of Downs and him settling into the game is another reason I like the Colts to hang tight in this one. I think this is a super interesting game and what has become an absolutely fascinating AFC South division. I thought it was the most open and shut one in the whole league going into the year, and it is not. Yeah, I never thought that. I always thought the Jaguars were overpriced over the offseason. I think I just picked the wrong team. I, I picked the Titans, but man, the Texans and the Colts have both have shown a lot of life, so... I uh, do want to bring, bring up, too, I think you're right. I think Minshew gives the passing offense a higher floor. Right now, I love Anthony Richardson. I think he – I had him as my QB1 in this draft class, and I haven't seen anything that would cool. dissuade me from that. Um, okay, that, now I disagree a little bit. Uh, he was my QB1. <laughs> I would have I, – I, I, 
I haven't been. Pro- I don't think I've been proved wrong on Richardson, but Stroud has done enough that I would flip him to the one spot at this point. But anyways, go ahead. Sorry, been, I like Richardson. Been too. Fi- it's been five games. Richardson is still extremely inexperienced, um, and I think he's looked awesome in what he's been asked to do. So, but in this game, I think Minshew gives them a higher floor in terms of passing the ball. And you can't really run the ball against the Jaguars anyways. They're an elite run defense, pretty average pass defense. So, Cody, any thoughts here? Honestly, not much more than what you guys have already mentioned. You guys kind of really crushed it. My big, uh, I I mean, I guess I'll just hammer away more at this. My big advantage is going to be I'm also on the Colts, and it's just going to revert back to the Jags offensive struggles that we saw early in the season. And that came because they have one of the worst offensive lines in football, and they're going to get absolutely abused. And when Trevor Lawrence is under pressure and has to get the ball out a lot quicker, it just kind of really um, kind of stalls out this offense. And now we're giving the Colts offense a lot more extra possessions to uh, at least stay within the number. Um, I think, I, I actually, I don't think, I know that the floor is definitely raised in the Colts passing department under Minshew. I'm still not sold as Richardson as a passer. Um, but like I said, it's five games in. I'm not going to make a duh, defend it, defend it, uh, whatever <laughs> um, uh, opinion on that. Um, but yeah, and I, and I think just, uh, elevating this passing game, we're kind of really rounding out this Colts offense, um, to at least, uh, to be competitive somewhat. And if you're giving them extra possessions, especially as a five point dog, I think they're more than capable of at least, you know, staying anything above three. I'm just really not sold on this Jags team. Me and Wayne were adamant over the summer. We were very low on this thing, which is hilarious because I, I think we did pick the wrong team, um, <laughs> with, <laughs> with the Titans, but whatever that happens. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this one. Yeah. Colts plus five, five and a half squad ride. Nice. Yeah. And just to clarify, I, I would still play it down to the current four. Would you guys as well? Oh yeah. I play this all the way down three, well, three right. and a half. Yeah. I mean, same. four and a half is a better number, but I, I don't think four is a bad one. I mean, push is not the worst thing in the world. You get your money back. Live to fight well, I'm just saying, yeah. pe- when people are when people are watching this, it might yeah, be they won't a have four. a four. I don't, I don't know if I, I mean I'd consider the three and a half. I don't think I'd go as far down as to the three, but yeah, you can play this below four. Fair enough. All right, let's go on to our next game, and this is my best bet of the week. It is Bengals minus two and a half here. I love what we saw from Joe Burrow last week. I think he moves in the pocket well. He was mobile. He looks comfortable planting off his foot. He looks like Joe Burrow again. And he had an all season. So, yes, he played the Cardinals pretty crappy pass defense. And, you know, that there's something to be said for that. But just seeing him move in the pocket was huge. Because previously it was like one read and that was it. Um, I still have questions about the Seahawks pass defense. They're 27 in pass defense success rate. And they've had some injuries in the secondary. Their pressure numbers are really good. But a lot of that has come solely because they faced two of the worst offensive lines in the league in the Giants and Panthers against like a high functioning offense. I don't know if that's going to be quite as uh, much of a factor for them. And the Bengals, I think are just undervalued right now. Their season long metrics are pretty rough across the board, but so much of that just comes down to Burrow being hurt for the first few games. And I saw enough to lead me to believe that he's healthy now. So I think getting them under a field goal at home against the Seahawks team is really, really good value. I know Seattle's coming off the bye week. I know this is a talented Seattle team, but I mean, this is the Bengals at home under a field goal with Joe Burrow. And T. Higgins might be back as well for their passing offense, which is huge. Um, curious if you guys think there's something I'm missing with this cap, but I, I love the Bengals in this spot. I'll go first. Um, I'm not I'm not necessarily against you, but uh, I'm taking the over. Um, yeah, I'm a little lower on the Seahawks as well. And to be honest, probably by the time we get to Sunday, I'll, I'll have a piece on the Bengals as well. I really liked what we saw. You nailed it uh, right away with the whole Burrow start of the season as a one-read quarterback. I mean, it was very apparent um, that he was dealing with this injury, and it looks like he's progressing. I'm no doctor. I am by far the farthest away from probably ever being able to make it through med- school, med- medical school. Um, but yeah, he, he's looking a lot better and a healthy burrow. Like, holy cow, this offense just really came to life. Uh, he realized that Majar, Jamar Chase is always open, but I'm not going to say it word for word how he said it. Uh, this is a friends and family type YouTube channel here. And this Seahawks defense, I don't know how they're even going to be able to slow them down. Um, the 27th and past uh, defense success rate. 
uh, which means, I mean, even if they're not even like connecting on the deep ball, they'll at least always, the uh, Bengals will always put themselves at least in friendly field position to uh, convert on later downs, uh, which keeps drives alive, which puts them in scoring position. 24 of them pass defensive DVOA. They do a good job of generating pressure, which I find that very interesting. But the Bengals' offensive line, they don't really allow sacks. They're seventh in um, adjusted sack rate. So they do, they do a good job of holding on. And if we have a healthy barrel, he's going to be a little more mobile. He's going to be harder to bring down. Uh, so I think the Bengals are pretty safe to do it on their end, to do their part towards the silver. And then the Seahawks, um, I mean, they grade out very well across the board, especially on offense. This Bengals defense, we were low on them early in the year. We said this was a unit to watch, uh, watch them progress, um, really mold later in the year. A lot of young pieces at some very, a lot of young players at some very key pieces. And their metrics kind of show that especially when defending the run. So now you're kind of really allowing the Seahawks to um, kind of shape the, how the Bengals defense, how they want them to be. If they want them to kind of stack the box, call a little run heavy with two very capable running backs, Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet. Um, and then Geno Smith is more than capable of throwing over the top with three certified weapons. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I, I think the singles offense, the, the Seahawks offense shouldn't really skip a beat and their offensive line has dealt with some injuries. I'm not too worried about the Bengals defensive line taking advantage of that. They're 24th in adjusted line yards and they're 27th in pressure. So that means like off the snap, they're not really getting a pushback whatsoever. So Gino, Gino shouldn't really find himself in pressure situations. And when he has a clean pocket, he's more than capable of hitting his receivers in stride. So yeah, the C Seahawks offense really shouldn't suffer any hiccups. I'm buying into what we saw lately out of the Bengals offense and think they can do their part. So yeah, I'll take this over at 45 or lower. Yeah, I did just want to add, um, you mentioned it with the Seahawks not taking on that much pressure, but Trey Hendrickson could be a game wrecker here. Uh, 22 pressures, seven sacks through five games. And Seattle still has four of their five offensive line starters on the injury report. They've done a good job of scheming around it. And I think they'll do enough. Um, but just worth noting that I think Trey Henderson could be the best player on the field on Sunday. We'll probably see yeah, more uh, because like the Bengals, like I don't want to call them one dimensional in that regard uh, on the line, but they don't really have like another like crazy guy to compliment them. No, um, that's true. I think Pete Carroll's definitely smart enough where you could scheme around that. We'll probably see more chip blocks or maybe a running back like drop back because I think even just losing one pass catcher to uh, sacrificing a pass catcher for more blocking, especially. For Trey, um, I think they're still more than capable of getting separation out. But we'll see. Hopefully, I, I'm starting to put my trust in Pete Carroll. I hope he can uh, keep that trust. Yeah. Schwartz, any thoughts from you? I'm not going to get too deep into the, uh, this. Is, it is a stay away for me. But, yeah, Joe Burrow did look like Joe Burrow. Again, that's 61% of his yards to Jamar, all three touchdowns, and then an interception of, other than throwing to Jamar. But jokes aside, Burrow is looking a lot better. But I don't know if I can trust that he's, like, fully full Burrow Again, until it's against someone who's not the Cardinals, I would like to not be handicapping him until I have a higher degree of faith in, not just for him to be great, but just like what he's going to be. Uh, if he's going to be diminished, maybe I'll, I can you know start to handicap that all year, but I, I don't want to touch him right now. That being said, for the game overall, I don't like the advantage that the Seahawks have in the run game on both sides. Their DVOA, EPA on offense and defense for run, very solid. Bengals... Not particularly that strong in either area. I, I don't know. I'm, I'd be leaning Bengals, but I just don't like that ability for the Seahawks to get out there and control the game. So I'm going to stay away from this one. Cody hit on the head. I, I am. Well, he seems lukewarm on Pete Carroll. I think Pete Carroll's incredible, uh, and I don't want to bet against him with Zach Taylor on the other sideline. So we're just going to leave this one be. Live to fight another day. Like as Cody said earlier, uh, get the notepad out and learn as much as we can from this one for me. Yeah, worth noting for me before we get out of here, the rush defense has been bad for the Bengals, 30th in DVOA, but if you look at their numbers, a lot of that is just due to missed tackles, and that tends to be pretty fluky over a smaller sample size, so I think they'll improve over the course of the season, and again, the Seahawks are dealing with a pretty banged-up offensive line, so not sure if they'll be able to run the ball as effectively when they're not facing the Panthers or the Giants, um, like they did the prior two weeks. So let's get into our next game, and man... Schwartz, I might be buying back in, man. It's, this Bears team, they've, they've looked pretty good. They've looked pretty good. It's the time to buy back in on the Bears, Schwartz. It depends what buy-in means. I mean, are the Bears going to go 1-16? Probably not. Are the Bears going to make the playoffs? 
Probably not, but oh my god, the schedule is such a joke. I'm starting to remember why I thought the Bears were going to win the division when I thought they could at least be like the shell of a decent football team because it is not a hard road from here. I'm seeing people only being slightly crazy talking about winning four out of the next five. That being said, Vikings aren't that bad. Their record's a little bit of a mirage. They're basically the opposite of last year's Minnesota Vikings where they're dead average in so many different categories, but instead of being on the right side of those thin margins of being dead average every week, they're on the wrong side every single week. So we've talked these Vikings to death, but one thing we haven't talked to death, Justin Jefferson. Justin Jefferson's not going to be playing. He's on the IR. That could not be more of a game changer for these Minnesota Vikings, especially in this matchup. If you're not going to be able to hit the Chicago Bears for deep strikes, you're not going to be taking advantage of the one thing that they have absolutely no ability to do, which is, you know, to defend explosive passing. So if you're not going to be taking advantage of the Bears' lack of pass rush by going deep or the lack of secondary by also going deep, I mean, they have guys. I mean, Jordan Addison shouldn't be fine, but you're taking away J.J. and they're coming into Soldier Field. I wish it was a three and a half instead of a three, but I am going to be on the Bears in this one for half a unit. This will be the game I talk about next Thursday when we're shooting this, and we're going over our worst plays. This is going to be the one, but I'm doing it. The numbers are there, and I'm trying. Like, what's the opposite of when you're like, you know, when you're biased for your team and you pick them every time? What what is it called when you just are done with them and you're terrified to pick them at any point? Whatever it is, I just want to avoid that. The Bears have burned me, but I really, really think this is a good spot for them to at least cover. And even if this is a game that they bears away and lose by a point in the dumbest way, boom, you've got your cover. So, I don't know, three is just a perfect number here, and if you get your push, whatever. Worst things have happened when betting on the Chicago Bears. Yeah, this is pretty simple for me. Um, Justin Fields has looked awesome against two crappy pass defenses in the Broncos and the Commanders, and now he gets to face another crappy pass defense in the Vikings. Um 25th in pass defense EPA. Their biggest issue is they get no pass rush. They lead the NFL in blitz rate, and they have the second lowest pressure rate in the NFL. That means that you're going to get one-on-one opportunities for Justin Fields downfield, which is where he's at his best, with them blitzing him, and they're not going to get home on him, especially with this ability to move in the pocket. So I think Justin Fields is going to do enough at home here uh, to help him get the win. Vikings have been pretty unlucky in a lot of key areas, but now they're down their best player. And this really isn't a team that has a lot of great talent. They're kind of like, Kirk Cousins is good, Justin Jefferson's elite, and then, I don't know, like their run game has been a pretty hit or miss for me. Their defense overall hasn't improved that much under Brian Flores, and this is a good spot for the Bears. It does feel like a buy high after they've looked good and then blew out the Commanders last week, but I kind of just like this matchup for them. Cody, I'm curious if you have anything to dissuade me off of it. Oh, yeah, I kind of disagree with almost everything all you guys have said. Um, <laughs> no, not almost everything. Um, but before I even get to the handicap, I think this is a great moment to teach some people. Uh, losing a player like Justin Jefferson does not actually change all that much. Um, and it sounds absolutely insane to say that out loud, but especially in a spread perspective, there are three non quarterbacks who are worth more than one point to the spread Justin Jefferson, Travis Kelsey. And I think it was Devontae Adams was there. Absolutely not. It's Tyreek Hill. He was ahead of Jefferson. No, oh, okay. So it was Tyreek Hill then not. So then Devontae Adams must have just missed the cut. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Um, and yeah, it's a one point difference to the spread. Um, NFL teams, I mean, it's built with talent. Now, the drop off from. Now, the reason that they're worth more than a point to the spread is not because, like, Justin Jefferson is the best receiver in the league. He is the best receiver in the league. But the reason it's a big drop-off is because it's based on the next man up, which is probably going to be Jordan Addison in this uh, perspective. But Jordan Addison is also more than capable of burning the Bears' middle, um, kind of fitting into what I would compare to, like, an Amon Ross St. Brown role. And then you got T.J. Hawkinson, who, I mean, when you have a great tight end, it just always gives really bad defenses fits. Madison, I am so torn on this guy. I was so high on him going into the year, and holy cow, is he disappointed. But I can't think of a better situation to explode back onto the scene. Uh, Bears rush defense, nothing special whatsoever, and their defensive line just gets no pressure. Um, or, no, they do They do a good job of holding on. They don't get sacks, my bad. Um, so I think that's going to keep the Vikings offense alive um, and be more than capable of allowing to move down the field. Now, I don't have a strong enough conviction to take either side, but what I will do is I'm going to take the over. And it's mainly because I'm 
kind of buying into this Bears offense, which just made me almost throw up on the spot, which would not make it for a great camera scene because we all know how I feel about Justin Fields. But as I think Wayne uh, said it, this Vikings pass defense, it's it's not good. Um, it's We're kind of going to mirror what we saw against the Commanders, um, especially as Fields builds a report with DJ Moore. Uh, we're going to see some more downfield action, and that is where it's going to burn the Vikings in a sense. The issue is, is that's just not a consistent level of play where it would make me want to back the Bears. But anytime they do connect on it, it's making my over look a lot better um, because I because I'm very certain that the Vikings can do their part. It's just I don't have enough conviction to take the Vikings on their end, and I definitely don't have enough on the Bears. But I do like the position that both offenses are in, so I'm going to eliminate the spread and I'm just going to go for the total. I'm going to take it over. You can get it at 44 and a half or a flat 44, sorry, and I would take this at no higher than 45. Yeah, we're getting into the time of year, though, where weather's going to start to be more of a factor. Mm-hmm. So that's a big one for this game. could be winds up to 20 miles an hour. So Schwartz is out in Chicago. Uh, he's my boots on the ground. I, I texted him every Sunday morning last week to find out what the weather was like out there. Um, so that's the only thing I would say is monitor the weather if you're going to play that under a caddy. Um, no, I'm not over. Um, or the over, and, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because I guess we can use this as another teaching moment. Um when it comes to weather, we'll just do a real quick thing. Um, wind is worse than rain. And it sounds weird to say, but I mean, with gloves like all this, like quarterbacks are more than capable of throwing in the rain, like all this. Well, except light rain, heavy torrential downpours, that's a whole different story. But but yeah, wind does play a bigger factor than rain. So that's definitely something I, I am going to monitor. I don't know if it'll be enough for me to buy out. Maybe maybe just let it ride. This is just a small look ahead play right now. But, but yeah, that is something worth monitoring. Last thing I want to bring up for the Bears, and it feels pretty significant given how bad their pass defense has been, Eddie Jackson, Jalen Johnson, and Kyler Gordon, debatably their top three defensive backs, are expected to be back this week, which is huge. Kyler Gordon hasn't played all season. Eddie Jackson and Jalen Johnson have been out for a couple weeks, so they're getting healthier on defense and still pretty crappy pass rush, but if their secondary is whole for this game, facing a Vikings pass offense that... I know it doesn't impact the spread, but no Justin Jefferson is still a big deal. And if the Bears secondary is healthy, I think there's a better chance than people are expecting that they could slow down Kirk Cousins here. Um, so, yeah, I like the Bears in this spot. Schwartz, any final thoughts on your Bears? Yeah, I forgot to express. Uh, Tevin Jenkins came back and he looked awesome. <laughs> I, uh, it doesn't really change anything I said, but it's just another thing in place for Justin Fields to have some success. And I guess I should, I, I didn't talk about Fields at all. I'm just I'm so proud of them. Some of the stuff that I've seen in the last couple of weeks, not even in terms of just, you know, the being results based and seeing that it's gotten, you know, positive outcomes, but just the way that they're using this offense. They're using DJ Moore that they invested so heavily in. They're not making Justin be a statue and frozen in the pocket. They're not running him, but they're using his legs in the backfield and in the in you know the short spaces to create opportunities in the pass game instead of trying to make him into a Peyton Manning, which as much as I love Justin Fields, that's never been the analysis on him and how to make him good. So I, I'm, I'm just positive on the direction things are going. It, it's pretty liberating in a way that this team doesn't have to choose between trying to compete and trying to get the top pick because the Panthers are easily the worst team in football. So this team could make a push uh, to actually win some games and get Justin some confidence and still have a shot at, at, I don't know, Drake May or even Caleb Williams, if that's what they decide, uh, and the Panthers are bad enough. So, I don't know, I think, it's, I think it's something we need to think about. There's not there's probably less of a hint of tank, tank, tank in the back of their mind, since they're probably going to get a solid draft pick either way. So, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong to be excited. Maybe I'm just getting romantic about my last Bears game while I'm living in Chicago. But, uh, yeah, it, this this is a spot, man. This is a spot. The Vikings are going to be... Vikings are going to be another pass defense that Justin has the opportunity to get some success against. And maybe, just maybe, now that they've actually started winning, maybe they'll break out the run a little bit. So, I would be, or for Justin. Yeah, I need so to I'm, monitor. I'm excited to watch. Need to monitor the status of Roshan Johnson. Khalil Herbert's out now, and Roshan Johnson's in concussion protocol. I assume he'll play because it was a Thursday night game, but that's something to monitor as well. And then final thought, because I know Cody's going to drastically alter the trajectory of his life if we keep talking about the Bears here, but... After this, they do get to play the Raiders and the Chargers, two more bad defenses. So, I don't know, man. Maybe where things are looking up for Justin Fields this season. Getting into our next game here, it is the San Francisco 49ers at the Cleveland Browns. 
Niners were really good to us on Sunday Night Football. They beat the Cowboys in very convincing fashion. And now they hit the road here to face Cleveland. Schwartz, how are you feeling about the Niners heading into this game? This is probably my favorite team to watch in the league, just in terms of the way they play football. Every time they hit the field, it's exciting to me, and especially against a team like the Browns, that in a lot of ways also plays a brand of football that I really like. Uh, That being said, we're going to hit this from two different angles. We're going to do a split play, half unit each, to mitigate our risk a little bit. The first angle I want to look at is the under. I grabbed 37. It's now 36 and a half I'm seeing with some quarterback uh, uncertainty for the Browns. Well, not uncertainty. Certainty that it's going to be problematic. Uh, Deshaun Watson himself, the you know expensive franchise quarterback they brought in, has not looked settled at any point in Cleveland. Then Dorian Thompson Robinson didn't look good at all in his debut. Now they're turning to PJ Walker as if that's going to be the secret sauce that uh, you know turns things around. Not that they're choosing him over Watson. Watson is hurt, but I don't think that as, as tough as it is to be a rookie and make your debut, I don't think DTR is the whole problem here. This offense just has not been good in any facet. Losing Nick Chubb is as almost as big as losing a running back can be. And it just there just hasn't been the explosive Browns offense that, you know, there was the potential to see this year. On the other side of the ball, I do love the Niners offense. I, I love it a lot, actually. But the Browns offense, man, it's been the best offense in the league by multiple metrics, EPA, DVOA. This could be the game where we see Brock Purdy, I don't want to say crumble, but like, Brock's been perfect this year. He hasn't thrown an interception. He's leading almost every rate-based quarterback metric uh, that's available. And this could be a game where he comes back to earth a bit. I mean, it's not a stretch at all to say this is the best defense he's faced since it's the best defense. Uh, And I don't know. This could be a tough spot for the Niners' offense as much as I do like so much of the talent they have. That being said, uh, I was in on the spread when it was minus 7. I don't... suggest investing in it at the eight and a half I'm seeing now but even though it's a road favorite we're talking about the Niners it only takes a couple of big plays from their unbelievable playmakers or a complete snuffing out of the PJ Walker offense for them to cover a touchdown I'm not going to dig too far into that because that number is not available anymore but if you want to you know buy a couple points down put six and a half in a parlay or something it could be a good angle because I really do think the Niners are going to be okay we're just going to throw the under uh, as a little bit of a hedge because it should hit. If they if they win, it should be due to an under. But if they lose, I don't think it's because this turns into a shootout. I think it's because the Browns defense did Browns defense things. So we're going to go under 37. Uh, we're going to, or 36 and a half. The spread, I don't know. See what you can get. But I, I'm not recommending playing a road favorite at anything over the flat touchdown, which is what I got initially. Yeah, I don't really understand what's happening with the spread, man. Uh, when we were talking on Sunday, Cody, um, we were like, oh, maybe we should bet the Browns next week. And that number was like three and a half when we were looking at it. And now it's eight and a half. Like, are we really seeing PJ Walker is five points worse than this Sean Watson? That makes no sense to me. Like, Watson's been bad this season. And PJ Walker last year, higher yards per attempt than Watson has this season. And a better EPA rate than Watson has this season. I think DTR got a pretty raw deal the week before the bye. Uh, he found out he was a starter, like, just before the game. It seems like it, there's something weird going on with this Deshaun Watson situation in Cleveland, but Walker's coming off the bye week. He's had plenty of time to prepare. This whole Deshaun Watson's questionable thing, like, I'm pretty confident that they've known for two weeks that P.J. Walker's going to be the starter for this game. And I think they're going to look a lot better than they did against the Ravens once they have time to prepare for that being the case. But the real handicap here is this Browns defense. And we talked about it before the year. The Niners' interior offensive line has a lot of issues. And against the Cowboys, that should. Uh, Aaron Banks, Jake Brendel, and Spencer Bur- Burford all had terrible pass blocking grades in that game. It's the entire interior offensive line. Now facing Miles Garrett, who's leading the NFL in pass rush win rate this season. And a really dominant defensive line in Cleveland overall. The big difference between the Browns' defense and the Cowboys' defense for me is this Browns' defense has also been dominant against the run. The Cowboys' run defense was an issue, and we saw it on Sunday night. The Niners were able to move the ball through on the ground on early downs and keep Brock Purdy ahead of the chains. In this game, if they're not able to do that quite as efficiently, and Brock Purdy's behind the sticks on third and long multiple times, that's a recipe for disaster on the road against this elite defense. And I agree with you, Schwartz. This total should go under, uh, looking at potentially 15-mile-an-hour wins. I don't see either offense having a ton of success here, but... I like the Browns in this spot, and I bet it a plus seven. I'm going to bet it again a plus eight and a half. I, I, I think it's way too many points, and Niners are my Super Bowl pick right now. Not fading this Niners team at all long term, but 
Last thing I want to throw in here is Kyle Shanahan has faced Jim Schwartz, the Browns' new defensive coordinator, nine times in their career. Shanahan is 1-8 in those matchups, and his offense has scored over 20 points just once in those games. You can say this is the best Niners offense that Shanahan has had, uh, the best offense that Shanahan has had in his career, rather. But even still, I, I like this Browns defense to keep this one close. Cody, am I crazy for fading Brocktober? Well, I mean, anytime you fade Brocktober, baby, of course you're crazy. <laughs> um, no, hand up. Um, I'm going to take a moment because uh, I need to get something off my chest. I am the most transparent better possible. I will absolutely, uh, what is it, eat crow? Is that the saying? I'll take an egg on the face. I make all my picks available to the public um, through a tracking app. No free ads. Um, obviously, you can find me on Twitter. I screwed up. Um, I took the Browns plus four when Wayne and I talked about it. Uh, hand up. Horrible, horrible bet. Very, very rare instance. Not only do I have a number go against me, but extremely rare instance it goes against me this much. Horrible, horrible on my end. I need to be better. With that said, I absolutely love where this number is at now. Because now I get to put the 49ers in a Wong teaser. And you know I love me a good Wong teaser. I have hit all of them so far except one. Thanks a lot, Commanders. Because um, I think I, I think the 49ers, this is their game to lose. Um, they're going to absolutely abuse this uh, Browns offense. I'm very, very pessimistic on how this is going to go on their end. But I think the 49ers can do enough against this Browns very elite defense. Best defense in the league by far. Um, they can do enough to at least win by three. Uh, the problem with defending the 49ers offense is that their ground game is so unique in the way that they pull. We, I've talked in length of how bad this interior 49ers offense is. Offensive, offensive line, sorry, a little hiccup. Um, but they're doing a masterful job. They're doing a great job at masking it. Uh, very good job. And it's bothering the crap out of me because I keep hammering away at it. And so far, teams cannot exploit it. Now, I think the Cowboys would have found a lot more success if um, they weren't absolute morons and kept uh, Micah Parsons in a one-on-one -on -one against Trent Williams. I do, not, I do not know why they just did not shift to the other end and just make uh, Purdy's life miserable. That was mind-numbingly dumb. I don't think the Browns are that dumb. Um, was a, I think they're more... I, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but that was a poorly coached game by Dan Campbell. Was I was horrible. very surprised by that. Wait, did you say he's by Campbell? Or Dan Campbell? Uh, sorry, by Dan Quinn. By Dan Quinn, the Cowboys oh. defense coordinator. Take my <laughs> no. coach's name out of your mouth, sir. <laughs> we by got Dan the Quinn, future the coach of the year coming. <laughs> I'm sorry, go, go ahead. <laughs> but I, I think the 49ers are capable of at least, you know, pulling this out. Um, they, don't even have, they don't have to do much. They don't have to show much just because they get the benefit of taking on a very expected weak Browns defense or offense just through everything that they're going through. So, yeah, they're going to be an awesome long teaser piece uh, for a team we're going to be talking about later in this video. Well, if you're, oh, well, shoot, I guess we do break these up by single videos. I'm teasing them with the Eagles, taking the Eagles down to one. And with this tease, I get the 49ers at two or two and a half. Nice. Yeah, I don't mind that approach. And I do just want to say, I, I like the under that Schwartz is talking about, but. Covering as eight and a half point favorites with an under with a total going under thirty seven, like that's not very easy to do. I mean, I guess it could be twenty to ten or something, but I see this game being like nineteen sixteen Niners or something like that. Like I think they're gonna struggle with their offense in these weather conditions against this elite Browns defense, and I think they're gonna do enough to win ultimately. But I like the Browns catching all these points at home. Let's get to our next game. Patriots at the Raiders. The Patriots are the bane of my existence this season and I hate them. I hate them. Um, they're going into this game facing uh, Jimmy Garoppolo and Josh McDaniels, two former Bill Belichick guys. And Cody, you have a play here that I really don't hate, but I, I can't stomach it. Let's get into it. All right. All right. If you've been watching our videos uh, the past few weeks, you know exactly how I feel about Mac Jones. I have been on the record to say that he is one of the most Horrible, overrated, bottom three quarterbacks in the league, and everything he does just reminds me of how much of an absolute pumpkin he is. That was until I went back and watched the tape a little. I've been way too hard on Mac Jones. This offense is not his fault. Even though that they are actually like the worst offense in the league in terms of EPA, they're dead last in rush and pass EPA, which I think is just hilarious because I love the Patriots' downfall. It's not all Mac Jones' fault. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get this twisted. I'm not saying he's a good quarterback. I still think he is an absolute pumpkin. Um, but I do need to ease up on him. The offensive line is not giving him any favors whatsoever. 
Um, I was very shocked to see kind of how not putrid, but how concerning these offensive line metrics are. I can't believe I didn't pull this up before I started talking about them. I'm restarting. What? Where the fuck are the Patriots on here? Oh, they're not. Aren't they a four o'clock game? Am I just passing it? Seattle. Oh, right yeah, under, I did pass it. God damn it. it. Yep, found it. God damn it. All right. All right. Oh my god, I gotta say a nice thing again. <laughs> That hurt my soul just to say it the first time. All right. Getting into our next game now, we got the Patriots at the Raiders. This Patriots team, man, bane of my existence. Um, they stink. I backed them last week. I thought they'd have a lot better game plan, better approach against that Saints team. And they just looked awful. Um, yeah. Bill Belichick going against Jimmy Garoppolo and Josh McDaniels. Cody, you got a play here that I don't hate, but I'm going to need you to talk me into it. Yeah, Patriots are the band of my existence, not just for this season, but my life, because I absolutely hate their fan base and all the winning that they've done in my life, um, because it's exactly what I want the Lions to be, and it'll never happen until this year. Um, but no, uh, if, if you've watched our videos, you know exactly how I feel about Mac Jones. I've gone on the record to say that he's one of the worst quarterbacks in the league, probably rivaling that of uh, Desmond Ritter, which I do believe that has gone too far. Um but no, after going back and watching, I do need to kind of temper what I have said about Mac Jones because I'm starting to realize that it is not all his fault. Now, granted, I don't think he's a good quarterback by any means. I still think he shoots himself in the foot plenty of times with his very questionable decision-making. But it's because he's kind of forced to. This offensive line has some issues, which is kind of really weird to see on I mean, a Belichick offense. They are 28th in adjusted line yards. That means off the snap, they are getting pushed back immediately, which is an issue. It creates a collapsing pocket, which puts pressure on your quarterback to try and make the play. Mac Jones is not that kind of guy. He needs a clean pocket to succeed. That's why he kind of excels in a two-minute offense when we see him ramp it up because they just can't get uh, back quick enough. Now, as for the Raiders, I have absolutely nothing nice to say. If it wasn't for one of the most poorly coached games I've seen, especially out of Matt LaFleur, who I'm really high on, the Packers should have just abused this Raiders defense, and they did not. This Raiders defense is absolutely horrific. They are 30th in pre uh, pressure. They are 20th in blitz. They are 26th in defensive in defensive line uh, sack rate, and they are 23rd in adjusted line yards on the defensive line. They cannot take advantage of this Patriots offensive line issues whatsoever, and it's finally going to give Mac Jones a cleaner pocket, and not only a cleaner pocket for him to uh, kind of thrive in, but it's finally going to open up holes for Ramondre, Ramondre Stevenson and if he can get this ground game going, it is going to absolutely open up the rest of this offense, which is something that the Patriots have just not seen so far in this season. And then you kind of can't quantify this, but do we even need to mention the coaching advantage? Are we in agreement that Josh McDaniels is the worst coach in football right now? If not at least guaranteed bottom three? I, I think he no is. No and He's yes in that order. Yeah, I think, I mean, we're, we're talking one yard away. Just give the ball to Josh Jacobs and end the game last game. And then uh, what was the Steelers situation? Score a touchdown and it's over, but they opted for a field, field goal. goal. Yeah. He might, he, he's, he's like the worst fourth quarter pressure coach of like of all time. So if Jimbo, he's Fi Jimbo make, Fisher vibes, man. He's not even he's the worst fourth quarter make, decision maker in his division. Sorry. If he's going to continue to make these kind of mistakes and routinely allow the Patriots to at least stay in the game, that's just giving me more conviction that they can at least stay within this key football number. I'm so out on Josh McDaniels. So, yeah, I mean, just like coaching alone, it's not something I like to really quantify, or not quantify, throw into my handicap, but this is definitely a big enough advantage where it does play a big part. And then on the flip side, yeah, the Patriots, they did lose some key pieces on the defense at multiple levels with injuries to uh, Judon and Christian Gonzalez, but they're still putting up decent metrics. I think it was just a deflated performance against the Saints because we're so low on the Saints offense. Um, that was... I don't, I don't want to put too much stock into that. Now, if the Raiders find that kind of same level of success, then we're going to have to really raise some question marks around this defense now. But I'm just not buying too much into it. I'm going to take the Patriots at this key football number, and um, I'm expecting a big offense uh, bounce-back opportunity here. Yeah. I, I, it, it's, oh, Patriots it's, are past, <laughs> it's Patriots are past on the spread, but I don't know, man. I kind of need to see them look like a competent football team before I can back them again. Um there's, there's like some weirdly uncharacteristic Bill Belichick stuff going on. Most notably to me is they're dead last in special teams DVOA. That's a big issue. And that's going to really hurt them on the margins, especially when you're facing a Raiders team that has one of the better kickers in the league in Daniel Carlson. So 
his Patriots are passed with that coaching edge, but yeah, it's a pass for me. Schwartz, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts on this one, like a lot. I don't know if you guys noticed me looking around, but I was actually looking for... I've got, I'm moving. I've got a lot of moving supplies in here. I was looking for a brown paper bag, much like the ones Wayne and I had ready for that brown for that uh, Broncos-Bears game. I just wanted to put one over my head. There's All I could see is plastic, and I'd suffocate, but I'd, I'd never have to watch this offense again. So, you know, there's pros and there's cons. So I want to just dig into first what Cody said. Uh, I just... The, the McDaniels thing, I didn't want to... It sounded almost like I was expressing support for him. I don't think he's the worst coach in the league, because I think he's 31st, because he at least has a basic understanding of offense and stuff. But it's Brandon Staley, and it's still... People people got on the paths for having an easy path, even though one of our biggest playoff losses was to a team in our own division. But anyways, I'll never get over the fact that Andy Reid got to coach six games against Staley, Hackett, and McDaniels last year. That just cracks me up. But about this game... This Patriots offense is completely bottomed out. Uh, Cody, you mentioned that you were a little surprised that the offensive line is bad. I'm not. Ever since Dante Skarniecki retired for the second time, it has been going downhill gradually and then precipitously. Special teams, we've also been bad on special teams for several years. Maybe Joe Judge is actually good at something, and it's and it's running special teams for the Patriots. This team is just completely, completely toast on offense. Uh, special teams, it's, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's actually 32nd in the league, like if it will stay that way throughout the course of the year, but there's a lot of issues here. But one of them's not really the defense. It's sad to lose Gonzalez and Judon, but there are definitely still producers here, and if there's one thing Bill can still do, it's run a defense, and there's, I don't think we're going to win this game. I would be, if I were taking a side to the spread, I would be taking the Raiders at home. I'm not going to, because you couldn't get me to invest in Josh McDaniels and Jimmy Garoppolo, which leads me to my next point. Bill Belichick doesn't do enough for the offense or know enough about the offense to force anything to happen there, but he this is still his defense, and there is not a universe, not a universe, where he lets Jimmy Garoppolo and Josh McDaniels combine to run up the score on him, even even to a little extent. This is his, like, this is a definition of a legacy game. Like, these are the guys that came up under you just running it up on your defense? Absolutely not. I swear, if this team also scores 30 like the Cowboys and Saints did, this is actually the end. There's no chance the Raiders' offense is going to accomplish anything. I don't think the Patriots' offense is going to accomplish anything as bad as the Raiders are defensively. I don't think we can take advantage of them. Raiders' offense, I don't know if this was said, 32nd in rushing offense DVOA, 31st in pass offense DVOA. Patriots offense is dead last in pass and rush EPA. These are This is the worst offensive game you could find anywhere this Sunday. Under 41 and a half. Don't know how there's games that are in the 30s when this one's not. Yeah, I'm glad there's three other games in this afternoon slot because I have zero interest in watching any of this game. Um, absolutely disgusting. Uh, let's get into a game that I think is pretty interesting. And we're going to talk about Cody's Lions, man. Lions traveling to face the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Cody, we talked about this spot two weeks ago, man, and we liked the Bucks. We liked the Bucks catching over a field goal at home. Now I see you're on the Lions. What, what changed, man? Well, I thought they were going to catch more than a field goal, to be honest. I was kind of really surprised to see how um, small this opened. But then I dug into it, and, man, did I surprise myself with uh, some things, especially scheme-wise. And um, – this is playing into the lines. This is not a biased pick. I will never make a biased pick unless I literally just outright say, Hey, I am making a biased pick. Um, AKA anytime North Carolina plays Duke in basketball, but, uh, no, we are football. This is the lines baby. And I love this matchup against the bucks, the bucks defense. Great unit. Great unit. Uh, we knew that going into the season, but the way that they operate is going to, uh, hurt themselves. And that is because the bucks thrive in, uh, blitzing, they're about league average in pressure, but their issue is, is all success from blitzing comes from their second level. Their defensive line does not really get a pushback whatsoever. They are ranked near dead last in defensive line adjusted line rate. And now they're going to have to do that against one of the best offensive lines in football. I'd probably say second. The Eagles definitely number one. Um, and not only that, but teams who blitz against Jared Goff um, without getting pressure it's going to get absolutely shredded against this Lions offense and how they operate. They thrive in creating separation with like Amaran St. Brown, Reynolds and all that, getting them into the middle. And now we're talking about yards after the catch. This offense should have absolutely no issue with moving the ball against this defense. And then we're not even factoring in that the, the Bucks, very weirdly for how good they've been, they really struggle at, uh, at limiting rushing production. 
and I think it's safe to say David Montgomery is running as one of the best running backs in the league. Not more so just because of like him, but because of this offensive line. They open up holes for him. They do a masterful job at scheming for him. So, yeah, so that's uh, for the offensive end. And then for the defense, um, I do have some concerns. I mean, we're I, I'm assuming Mike Evans is going to be good to go. Chris Godwin is going to be out there. Uh, the Buccaneers offense, I mean, great, good, good pass attack. Baker Mayfield, he's turning his career around. You absolutely love to see it. And the Lions, we still have question marks, especially in coverage. But the beauty of this is that the Rams, or the Bucks offensive, I don't know why I just said Rams. The Bucks offensive line is 30th in adjusted line yards. And now they have to go against a very good <laughs> Lions defensive line, which I don't know why. That gives me a laugh every time I say that out loud because I was so low on them going into this year. The Lions are turning into a team that is capable of just rushing four and dropping everyone else back. So now we're kind of going to uh, muck up these passing lanes for Baker Mayfield. He'll probably still find success here and there. I mean, we don't have a great coverage unit. But the fact that we just have extra bodies out there, we're potentially bringing in more havoc. We can flip the field position. We can at least cre- create some stalled-out drives. I think this is the Lions game to lose, and this could be, this could be a very impressive one. Now, I, because I know Wayne's going to say it if I forget to say it, there it is a true factor that Jared Goff, is an absolute pumpkin on the road, outside, in non-ideal conditions. It is looking like, as of now, wind is going to play a pretty big factor, which can affect the passing game. But, man, I don't know. If, you're, if we're just talking about this wide-open middle, and if the Bucks kind of don't really adjust... If, if, if I see early on that the Bucks sacrifice some of the blitz for more coverage, I'm probably actually going to look to buy out. That will give... Um, Goff, uh, huge hiccups. We've seen it before where they drop more back in coverage. But as of right now, just looking at the numbers, it's not screaming that that's how they're going to play it. So I'm going to buy it as if they're going to bring down into a good amount of the blitz. So yeah, I love how the Lions really shape out on both ends here. I would not buy this any higher than three. And if for some reason by Sunday this shoots up to four, four and a half, I'm probably going to uh, try and not go for a middle, but I'm probably going to buy half out on the Bucks. But yeah, I love the way that the Lions are shaping out in this game right now. Yeah, you hit a lot of the points that concern me with this Bucks team. Schwartz texted me earlier in the week, like, what's going to stop this Bucks team from winning the NFC South? And the list I gave him was bad rushing offense, bad run defense, bad special teams, and a team that blitzes at a really high rate and doesn't get pressure that often. Those are all issues against this Lions team. So I'm not going to bet the Lions here. It's it's kind of a good spot for the Bucks coming off the bye week and. I still feel like we haven't learned that much about either one of these teams, to be honest, um, based on who they played. So it's a pass for me. If you want to bet the Bucks, wait for a three and a half. I think you're going to get it by kickoff. But yeah, it's a pass for me. Schwartz, any thoughts for uh, you? Let me, let me say something before Will again, because I'm really glad you just said that. Obviously, the way I talk, I make it sound like this Lions are like an absolutely like, dominant unit. The more like you look back on their schedule, the Chiefs win absolutely massive, especially week one on the road. But you got to remember, they didn't have Kelsey. They didn't have Chris Jones. Um, Seahawks, you know, I'm high on them. They lost to the Seahawks, though I think that loss was definitely more on our coaching. We had four we had four horrific fourth down decisions that swung that game. Lions well, were pretty banged up their, in that game, too. And, yeah, but horribly banged up. And then you look at their next three wins. Falcons. Falcons ain't looking good lately. Uh, well, other than just the Desmond Ritter explosion last week. Packers, we're kind of getting a more of a clue on Jordan Love here. And then the Panthers, who we're all very low on. I'm not saying that's enough to say that, like, oh, yeah, the Lions like, aren't this great team because they are playing like it. But it does kind of bring in a little more mystery of now. I'm They're about to go out against a very well-rounded unit against the Bucks and off the bye, which is also a rusted factor. So, yeah, so that's definitely playing into it and kind of why I'm slightly tempering expectations and why this is a much smaller play than normal. But, yeah, it's still Lions at three or better. Schwartz, go for it. Yeah, we should not be betting anyone this year after they play the Panthers. That's a big no-go for me. It's just it's just like it's like betting Alabama after they beat uh USF going into a game against Texas. It just makes absolutely no sense. This Panthers team is so far below everyone else in the entire league that you're going to look great and it's going to be a buy high spot every single time you're coming off a win over the Panthers. That being said, I'm also not betting the Bucks. I'm a little bit afraid of their ability to run the football. Love Baker, but uh, their rush offense is 31st in success, 26th in EPA, man, I can't see, and 27th in DVOA. They're not going to run the ball on this Lions front. There's absolutely no way. Can Baker win this game and score a bunch of points just with his arm? 
Maybe, but if Mike Evans is going to be questionable and maybe not 100%, I don't know about that one. That's going to be a really tough sell for me. As far as the, the total, nah, I'm not going to touch the full game total either because I am a little bit afraid about that Bucks run defense. It's grading really badly, but as I responded to Wayne when uh, we had that conversation earlier this week, and by the way, in terms of that future, another reason that they won't do it is the schedule. It's the worst one, but other than that, I think the run defense issues are maybe fluky, overblown, a product of having played the Eagles in one of the four games this season. All the pieces are in place. They should be fine. Uh, but I don't want to take that risk specifically against a run offense that has been really, really effective. So what we're going to do is Bucks under 20 and a half due to those issues with the run and the concerns with Baker being the complete engine for this offense against you know, a Lions defense that has been really, really good this season, or at least relative to what we expected definitely don't like that they're not going to blitz him. I like Baker's ability to pick apart a, you know, a limited secondary when the blitz is coming. So we're going to go under 20 and a half for the Bucks. I think it's going to be, uh, this is my game that I'm the most excited to see this weekend, but I think it's going to be a low scoring one. If I had to make a call, I'd be on like, I don't know, Lions 17-14 or something like that. Real low scoring old school football game. I'm super excited, but I don't know. I think I have to fade the Bucks as much as I love to see this offense succeed. That's a lot lower. That's a lot lower of a score than I would expect. But last thing I want to say before we get out of here, the Bucks. Cody talks about the Lions schedule. We don't really know that much about this team. The Bucks beat the Vikings and Bears in weeks one and two, two pretty terrible teams. Got stomped on by the Eagles at home, and then beat the Saints with Derek Carr being pretty injured. So. Yeah, I just don't think we know that much about these teams. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to get some more research on both of them moving forward. Two more games left, boys. Let's get into the NFC West matchup between the Cardinals and the Rams. Rams finally got Cooper Cut back. Love to see that for my fantasy football teams. But heading into this matchup, facing a Cardinals defense that I think doesn't have a prayer of stopping Cooper Cup or Puki Nakua. Schwartz, you have a similar thinking with your best play from this game. Absolutely, and drum roll, I haven't mentioned it yet. This, this one is the whale of the week. We're going 2.2 units on the over for 48.5, which, yes, is definitely a significant football number. The Rams' defense, not one out of these categories. Run versus pass, or run or pass, DVA, OA, or EPA, not one of those categories are they top 20. Nine, or the Cardinals' offense is fringe top 10 in... Most categories, despite the fact that they've played the Cowboys and the Niners, so these are not opponent-adjusted stats, or at least EPA isn't, so those should be, you know, pretty declined by having played great defenses. Deflated was the word I was looking for, and they haven't been. I mean, if they have been, that means the Cardinals are a top-10 <laughs> offense comfortably. So uh, a lot of great stuff from them. All the credit in the world to Josh Dobbs, who's had kind of a weird route to getting a starting job, but he's doing good stuff with it. Now, that being said, the Cardinals still have only won the one game, I'm pretty sure, without looking right now, and they were considered a tank for Caleb team for a reason. The defense is as bad as advertised. They're bottom three to five in pretty much all the categories that we talk about. While the Rams have Cooper back, Puka's still doing Puka things. Matt Stafford, 14 big-time throws compared to five turnover-worthy plays. It's Sean McVay's offense against a bad in-division defense. It's a troubled Rams offense against a plucky... Or, Troubled Rams defense, rather, against a plucky Cardinals offense. Love this one. I mean, when you think about it, 20, 48 and a half. 24 to 24 is under that. Like, So one of these two teams getting into the 30s gives you an excellent shot to get this over unless the other one pitches like a completely unprecedented anti-analytic shutout. So I love this one. It's my play of the week. And, yeah, let's see some points. West Coast shootout. Yeah, I'd rather just go with the Rams team total over personally at 27.5. I have the matchup preview for this one. I haven't picked my official bet for there, but I think that's where I'm going to be leaning. I also really like Cooper Cup to score a touchdown in this game. You can probably get that around even money. Uh, Cody, any thoughts here? Rams team total over 27.5. <laughs> I haven't bet it yet yeah. either, but I, I, I've just been staring at it. it. We're at the point of the season where we kind of do have concrete data um like I, i've been vocal about it i always like to wait a few weeks um, i hate when people make you know rash um opinions right away this cardinals offense though is just playing so above expectations it's still hard for me to kind of believe it because we just pegged them for so low and it's just it just doesn't make sense to me yet 
Now, they do have the beauty of going against a Rams defense who we were very low on, except for rush defense success rate, um, because we like we play that fun little game where it's try and name as many Rams defensive players, defensive starters as you could, and it didn't go very well. Um, but if there is going to be one constant in this game, and that's where I'm going to back my money, is that this Rams offense is firing on all cylinders. I absolutely love what I'm seeing, and this Cardinals defense is playing exactly how we expected, and it's one of the worst units in football. Uh, factor in a healthy Cooper Cup, who absolutely balled out right away in that like first possession. Um, Puka obviously still playing a major role. I don't know how the Cardinals are going to s- limit this Rams offense. There is no reason that they should not be able to move the ball with absolute ease. We're talking 29th pass defense EPA, 30th pass defensive D- DVOA, and 31st pass defense success rate. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a fantasy guy, but if Stafford's still on your waiver wire or whatever, pick him up. <laughs> I had to pick him up in two of my leagues because I have Joe Burrow in one. Kind of want to wait it out before because it's a pretty decent sized money league. So I really need to win there. But I'm so high in Stafford this week. I think he's in a great position to ball out. Um, he's not going to face pressure whatsoever. The Cardinals don't blitz. He's going to have a clean pocket. And that's really going to help mask um, a kind of a bad Rams offensive line. I th- I think that's the one constant in this game. And 27 and a half, you're getting a minor secondary key football number. So, yeah, um, take that no higher than 28 and just watch this Rams offense just dominate. Yeah, I'm locking that in as official pick right now. I like your, your argument Same for it. Mitchell, but... Yeah. All right. So, they got Rams team total over for me and Cody in the over for Schwartz for the full game. Let's get into our final game now. The Philadelphia Eagles at the New York Jets. Schwartz, I see you have in here Jets plus seven. I've been staring at it all week, and I, I think I'm going to bet it. I just need you to talk me out of the idea of Zach Wilson getting eaten alive by Jalen Carter in this game, because that's what's scaring me from, from actually firing on it. Zach Wilson is back. No, I'm just I, kidding. I, Zach Wilson's he's, he's never going to justify his draft position, but I really, I, I really respect what's going on with Zach. I mean, he's taken so much heat before the season and in the season. He's standing tough. He's, he should have the Jets at 3-2. and two. They had the Kansas City Chiefs. They had that game. And at worst, they're, I mean, they got that huge Bills win in one of the weirdest emotional spots of all time. They went and, you know, they beat up the Broncos a little bit. I mean, really, really, you know, he's not a high-end quarterback, but he's stabilized a lot. And I'm really impressed with it. Now against Jalen Carter, that's a whole, I mean, this whole Eagles defensive front, there's a lot of ways they can get after him, but I don't know, the Jets don't run, I mean, the Jets don't have the offense that they were going to with Rodgers, but they don't run a dumb or unintuitive offense, like we, we, I mean, we gripe about coaching here almost every single week, I mean, Cody, like, it's like his favorite part of the job, I feel like, and I love to do it too, but um, it's usually not the Jets, as as much as the Jets are going to jet, we don't, we haven't seen really ridiculous coaching from them, and I think they have a good understanding that you need to get the ball out. Garrett Wilson's a great receiver for if you want to be playing fast pass offense. The one thing that's going to be a little bit problematic, I don't know if they're going to get Brees Hall going against that defensive front. Look good against the Broncos when you cashed on that. Uh, But, yeah, the Jets have only given up... Oh, shoot, I forgot I have two plays here. In addition to the Jets plus seven... Uh, we have the Eagles team's total under 24 and a half, which I'm, I'd like to get into first because that obviously is a huge contributor to the Jets staying in the game, preventing the Eagles from scoring. Jets have only given up this many in a game once, and they played the Buffalo Bills, they played the Cowboys, and that was the game where this went over, but it only went up to 31. Zach had three picks and constantly set up the Cowboys with short fields, and it still took Brandon Aubrey hitting Field goal after field goal. The Jets were bending but not breaking. And Zach seems to be settling into the point where he should not be turning it over three times. And in terms of the you know the overall spread, the Eagles just haven't been the juggernaut that I expected them to be this year. There's some, you know, there's some mediocre defensive metrics that should come up. The offense has it's been better, but it hasn't been as automatic as you would hope, uh, compared to what we saw down the stretch last year. I don't know, man. It's at MetLife, it's gonna be a crowd that hates Philly. I mean, it's gonna be loud in there for sure. I I think the Jets can stay in this one. It could be a push. I could finally lose my first Jets bet of the season, but Jets plus seven and Eagles under twenty four and a half. If you're going to bet Jets plus seven, you absolutely should bet Eagles under twenty four and a half because I have no idea how the Jets cover if they let the Eagles get into the mid to high twenties. If you actually think Zach's going to hang like twenty five, then you're even higher on this Jets offense than I am. Yeah, I mean the big thing that stands out to me here is the Jets are the third best 
red zone scoring defense this season, and the Eagles are 27th in red zone scoring offense. I think there's a bit of a play calling issue there for the Eagles. They lost uh, Shane Sykin, who one of my favorite coaches in the NFL, and it hasn't really been quite as clean. They've been able to lean on the run quite a bit this season, but the Jets' run defense is elite, fifth in EPA. Uh, I think I think the Jets can do enough to hang inside the number. Cody, is there any way you can talk me out of it? Because if not, I'm going to probably take the Jets right now. Well, I mean, I already indicated earlier how I'm attacking this. I'm putting the Eagles yeah. in a teaser piece. Um, now, if I weren't to do that at all, I would lean towards the Jets. Beautiful number. But, man... Um, I am getting a little higher on Zach Wilson, but if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. I don't know how he's going to handle this this Eagles defensive line. Um, I mean, the Jets' offensive line is one of the worst units in football, um, and this Eagles' defensive line is just going to absolutely feast on them, and they are going to send relentless pressure just by, honestly, dropping four on them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're kind of now giving the Eagles a chance to drop more back in coverage because if there has been one really weird oddity for this Eagles defense, and we've said this multiple times, is that they have absolutely no spine in the pass game. And what that means is they're allowing teams to beat them through the middle and the air. Now, when you're dropping more back in coverage, you can mask that middle with more bodies in the, in the area. And if you're still rattling Zach Wilson with four, it's going to be an absolute nightmare for the Jets offense to uh, figure out how to get any way around this uh, unit. Now, on the other end, um, the Jets defense, I mean, we know they're elite, but one, but, uh, well, weird, like an oddity that was, we just said about the Eagles, the Jets kind of struggling in, uh, pass defense. Now the pass game is kind of like sputtered at times for the Eagles offense throughout this season. They've dipped back to just slightly above average and, um, advanced metrics, but it, kind of the way this is matching up, I mean, it's going to be open for them, but I think it's enough of a struggle where it's keeping me away from where I wouldn't back the Eagles in the number, especially uh, that high of a number. So that's why I'm more than uh, happy with just kind of basically getting them at a money line, a, mi- a minus one into my teaser. Um, they're just so much versatility. You, it's They could take advantage of really anything, any coverage or dis- or um, or scheme that they kind of throw at them, especially if they can generate rush success. Now, a way to beat a good rush unit is with an offensive line. The Eagles' offensive line is the best uh, offensive line in football. So if they can push back and kind of really just open up and kind of force the Jets to stack a little more in, it's going to open up more passing lanes. So, yeah, I'm just more high in the Eagles finding success um, throughout the game overall than the Jets. But I'm going to take the added security by getting that uh, teaser because, um, like I said, it really helps me out in my 49ers position because I just have an absolutely horrible Browns number. Um, So I really would like to claw a little money back (laughs) that way. And if I have to pick one team to kind of for that added security, it would be the Eagles. Yeah, I'm going to take the Jets plus seven. Um, I'm looking at their schedule right now, and I like that that they've been battle-tested against some of the best defenses in the league. They've already had to face the Bills, the Cowboys, the Chiefs, and then also Bill Belichick's Patriots. And, like, to me, that shows that they've, they're have they capable of at least hanging in with some of these better defenses. And the Jets' defensive line is one of the only ones in the league that can actually hang tough with the Eagles' offensive line. I don't think the Eagles have th- that massive advantage in the trenches like they do normally for their offense. So I'm curious to see how that affects their overall productivity here. And, Cody, you mentioned the, the struggling pass defense numbers for the Jets. I realize why that's the case, and it's because they're more than comfortable allowing de- teams to dink and dunk with, like, 10, 15-yard completions, but they really lock up when they're in the red zone. And we talked about that red zone discrepancy. I think that's why these, like, 21st in success rate, but they're not allowing that many points per game, is because they're mm-hmm. comfortable letting teams have short area passes, but once they get in the red zone, they lock up, and... I think that's going to be the case here. So, last thing, I, I didn't the think old Bill chance. Belichick, uh, the Belichick defense against the Dolphins. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, last thing, didn't think I'd be saying this before the season, but Nathaniel Hackett's doing a good job, man. Um, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I, I've been impressed, man. Like, like Zach Wilson looks like a competent quarterback right now, which like didn't, was not the case previously for him, and. I think Hackett's play calling has been pretty good. So I'll give him some flowers there. I uh, got the win over my Broncos last week. But I'm taking the Jets plus seven in this game. I think Eagles win something like 24 to 20. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to push back on the Hackett thing. And I'm not going to act like I saw this coming. I'm not as surprised that he is finding some success. I think it's just very apparent that he was not meant for a head coach role. I think yeah. like less duties, just a more focused role really suits him. 
So I mean, but great for him. I'm happy for him. And the 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 beating the champagne thing that was amazing. That made me so happy. Yeah. Um, didn't make me happy, but that's right. Uh, uh, Schwartz, sure, yeah. <laughs> you're a Broncos fan. Schwartz, <laughs> any final thoughts on this Jets Eagles game before we get out of here? No, I'm super excited to see how it plays out. These are two of the teams I was highest on uh, before the season that I think you guys were a little bit lower on. So I'm excited to see how it plays out. I think the Jets have had a really cool start to the season. I mean, obviously sad in a lot of ways, but it's been, I don't know, if Rodgers is able to get back and be healthy next year, I think this Jets team has shown people what they can do, that they can be competitive. And, oh, my God, if the Patriots are any better next season – that AFC East division is going to be ridiculous if they're getting Rodgers back. Or if Rodgers is, you know, unable to come back, maybe they'll have an offseason to figure out a new guy or move Zach or something. So, I don't know. Very excited for the future for this team and excited to see two really solid teams with fan bases that do not like each other, even though the teams aren't specific rivals, get after it. So, that'll be a really fun one. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm kind of, I mean, I'm in a great position. I mean, if the Jets kind of upset the uh, world and, you know, beat the Seagulls. I think I could start getting a little more vocal that the Lions might be the second best team in the NFC. So that's a win-win for me. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think this Jets team is just playing inspired football right now, honestly. And I think they're going to be feisty as a home dog whenever you're catching this many points. So I like the spot. I'll fire on Jets plus seven. So a couple of mid-show bets there. That'll do it for us. Go follow us on Twitter. Um, Cody and I always post our, our full Sunday cards over there. So you can get access to our full plays. A uh, little shout out to Twitter's real quick. Cody, you are at K Mousroom. Yep. And Schwartz, you are at Will Schwartz 75, I believe. That's it. Yep. All right. And I am at Wayne underscore sports. So go give us a follow over there. Get our full cards for these games. Check out our Sunday Night Football preview as well. Not the best game. Giants, Bills. But I think there's some value on the board to be had there. So we'll be talking about that one. And yeah, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Helps us out a ton. And we will catch you in another video very soon.